Welcome. I'm Jessica Tejan, and this is the Evolving to Exceptional podcast, where we talk about reaching peak performance in our workplaces, homes, and communities so that we can live our best life possible, an exceptional life. Welcome back to our Evolving to Exceptional listeners. This is a this week's new episode with a wonderful guest, Adam Hart. Adam Hart has a ton of experience and background in personal performance coaching. He's written a book about the power of food and just done a ton of work in this space. And Adam, I know from looking at your information and and looking at, at your website that you've got a unique story as to how you got to where you are today and and how it is that you do what you do today. So can you maybe just give us a little bit of that background, that story, that why as to to how you got to where you are and what it is that that you do today and why it is that you do it? Yeah, absolutely. And first off, thanks for having me, Jessica. I really appreciate it. Uh, I know that we have a lot of overlap in the work that you do and obviously the audience that you take care of and take care of very well. I know that space very well. My big discovery was coming from my own occupational burnout and doing the daily grind, the nine to five. And I have a degree in sociology, a diploma in international business management, went right to work in my, my twenties and started to strive for the corporate ladder. And I crumbled and I just got fortunate that I crumbled so young that I was able to change course before I had a family, before I had the the mortgage that I couldn't get out of. So my journey really took on this, this beautiful connection to my own self-worth, self-love that I had disconnected from my upbringing and then my burnout. So it took me, it took me a while to figure it out, but I know we were chatting a little bit before, but I discovered this six step process that I call the Unleash Your Energy Roadmap that kind of got me back on track. And it's been something that I've been coaching on for the past 15 years. So, so tell me a little bit, cause I, I talk a lot about my own burnout experience that led me to where I am today. Mm-hmm. Tell me how old were you and what was it that, that called attention to what, what was going on that really, I don't know if that's the right word, but highlighted the challenge to you and caused you to then have awareness of, oh, this is what I'm experiencing and mm-hmm. I got to do something different. I just kept getting diagnosed with different ailments. They were all coming from the symptoms of my own stress response and not knowing how to manage that and how to work with my own brain and how my brain was getting stuck in these looping patterns of ways of thinking. And then my emotions just got so stagnant that I, the internal response biologically. So mentally I was suffering with ADHD. I was given medication in my teens. There was a real a lot of shame and guilt and frustration that was coming from that diagnosis. Then my body was starting to fail in terms of being highly inflammatory, highly imbalanced hormonally, sugar addicted, and then being pre-diabetic when I was 24, 25 is when I was diagnosed pre-diabetic. And that was, for me, was the big wake up because, oh my God, my, my mind is completely a mess. I can't think clean and clear for even a couple of minutes and my body was failing and I didn't really know any other way of doing anything. All I knew is I just had to keep grinding through. This is what you're supposed to do is just keep grinding. You'll figure it out. You'll figure it out. My big discovery was when I learned how to regulate my response to everything and the nervous system regulation became my portal in and opened up a whole new doorway for me to experience life in the most beautiful way. It's interesting as you're talking I can relate so on such a deep level, right? So I was diagnosed as ADHD, but I, I was diagnosed as a child. So I was only eight years old. So there's even, there's a, a lot of shame then. You don't even know what it is you're really being diagnosed with or why you're, you're reacting or responding or having to take this medication. And then, and then, yeah, you get into that grind and that pushing through in terms of your life goals and what you're trying to achieve. And, and I think a lot of people don't, necessarily know, at least I didn't in my journey, despite going to law school and having all the degrees and all the education, I didn't know what those signs were. I didn't know. So I also kept getting sick, multiple autoimmune conditions, the things that come with it. But but doctors don't necessarily say to you, oh, it's probably stress 
or it's your nervous system, or they're focused on diagnosing or treating whatever those particular symptoms or yeah. attributes are. Yeah. Do you have a set of of criteria or a set of what people could use to help them identify, oh, I'm on this path. Oh, this might be my challenge or this might be my problem. So yeah. people can even identify it. Yeah. And that's this, like I mentioned, the six step roadmap, which for anybody who's hearing this, as we get into this, you can get more details of it by downloading it. It's at my website, clearimpact.io, clearimpact.io. You can grab it there. The first step though, is we have to know what our own patterns are. And so if we start to recognize the brain works in one predominant area, which obviously we know is an organ, a beautiful organ that it is, it's a survival organ. So it wants to go after energy in the ways that it knows it can get energy. And if our fight or flight response, which is what the dominant source of energy is, our adrenaline from our fight or flight. If we don't become familiar with how to feed the brain differently, the brain is going to utilize the 70,000 thoughts a day that we have in ways that get us to be triggered because it wants to be fed our reactivity to those thoughts. And so you think about your own childhood and what we all went through as children. And as soon as we had a stressful experience as children, was there somebody there that knew how to help us regulate that experience? No. Some of us maybe, but it's so rare for us to have a caregiver, a parent or another caregiver who understands how to regulate their own response to stress. And so there's no co-regulation in our upbringing. And so as we enter into those experiences of life that become somewhat painful, whether you get a, a bully in the, in the playground or you have your first breakup or you get diagnosed, ADHD is prevalent now, it's very easy for the brain to start to use that to keep us locked into these patterns of feeling shame and guilt and self-esteem, self-worth. And so we're going to have a lot of those patterns. We have to become aware of those. That's step one. The thing is then we enter into adulthood. And as we enter into our adult years, the brain starts to learn all the adult responsibility-based ways to keep us triggered. And those we know there's four dominant ones, and that's our health, our relationships, our finances, and our career. And as we start to find these moments of stress in those areas, the brain is learning even more like a computer system. It's learning algorithms of where we're being triggered. And it's starting to loop more of these 70,000 thoughts a day, locking us into thoughts of needing to fix. I gotta fix this. This isn't quite working. I'm feeling resentful to my partner. My kids are screaming and yelling and I'm getting so impatient. These are the moments that your brain has got you locked in reactivity and denying you the ability to do step two. And step two is the ability to start to work with your own mind to create peace in those moments. And that was my big dis discovery was my ability to reset my own stress response in the moments of life. It wasn't about the meditation practice I kept being told I should do or the another yoga practice I'm supposed to now fit in somehow or the fitness program or the diet that I did so many of those and they all left me feeling more frustrated and guilty. It's about working with the moments to train your nervous system, to teach your brain to let go of all of these pattern ways of locking us into being reactive so that then we move into the space of having choice. That's where life is lived. So I love everything you're talking about. And as you talk about starting with that first step and recognizing the experiences that we have growing up and whether we had someone there who knew how to regulate their nervous system. Can you maybe expand on that a little bit as to what that looks like? What does it look like to have a parent who knows how to regulate their nervous system versus someone who's already dysregulated? Yeah. For the average person, they may not know, oh, did my parent know this or yeah. what was my experience? What does that look like? Yeah. And they are very distinct differences. And that when a large part of it comes from the fact that the thoughts that we have and the words that we say have a frequency to them. So this is the quantum physics of it. And so much of our life experience comes from our emotional frequency. The emotions we hold is what we tend to experience more of. So what we're lacking is the ability to integrate our own emotions, to actually feel them so that we can let them process and let them go and have other possibilities and how we get to emotionally experience life. And so as a child, if you don't have a parent who knows how to do that, 
you are going to know because it's going to be a very friction-based upbringing. And you're going to be doing a lot of hiding, a lot of solitude, a lot of isolation, a lot of loneliness, because you're doing everything and anything you can to avoid feeling the pain, feeling the hurtful emotions. Now, if you have a parent who knows how to process their own emotions, which comes from the regulation of their own nervous system, they're going to show up in a way where you feel lighter, you feel happier, you feel more connected, more a desire to be in community and be engaging and not so isolated. And so that's the dominant two quadrants that you experience. And I do a lot of work with men and a lot of work with men in terms of learning how to self-love. And a lot of the conversations are based on the fact that I don't even know what that is. Hmm. How do I do that? What do I, what am I looking for? What? So it's a, it's a very common human experience right now. And it comes from Yes, we have trauma and we can label it all we want, but in the end, it just comes from a lack of adaptation, a lack of human adaptation in the modern world where the modern world has us experiencing so much stress from our daily lives that we're not able to fully embrace the emotional experience of life in a way where we can let the brain let go of the use of our hormones in that interaction the use of our neurotransmitters in that interaction. And if we don't, if we don't know that's what's happening, then we just become a slave to our reactivity without really living. I think it's so interesting when you describe it that way. And when you think about the emotional reactivity that so many of us grew up with, and not that I think what's important to point out for listeners is that it's not that your parents weren't loving they weren't caring. They didn't want to do the best that they could. It's not that they were bad or that they were wrong in that context, but rather it's a, a distinct understanding of the, the skill set or the tool set to what you described of here's the, the emotion. And, and the way I like to think about it is that there's a physiological reaction that happens in our bodies when we experience an emotion. But if we don't know how to recognize what that is and what we feel as a result of, that physiological reaction and process through it, that energy has to go somewhere. Right. And so if somebody is triggered, so say you've got a parent who's triggered with anger, they feel that that sense of anger or that sense of fight flight response. And then you have a child that misbehaves, that energy comes out in yelling or discipline or a, a, a reaction um, in some way. And that yeah. uh, the way that I paint a picture for myself of Okay, so it's not that 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 person did anything wrong or intentionally was dysregulated. It's that they weren't aware of that emotional experience and then how to process through it. Yeah, and didn't have the tools in order to actually work with their own reactivity. So what are some of those yeah. tools? That's a perfect <laughs> thing. What are some of those tools to, to really work with the, the, those emotions to, you got to start with identifying them, but then what do yeah. you do with them? How do you move through them or regulate them in a way that allows you to stay in a more balanced state? Yeah. And I appreciate it. And there's only one, there's lots, but there's only one that we want to focus on when we begin to do this work. And I call it heart flow. It's a breath practice, but it's a breath. And I know there's thousands of breath practices out there. This one is very specific to being able to reset your own nervous system in the moments of life that you need it. And this is what I needed as a dad as well, a dad of two and busy business owner and lots of responsibilities. It's okay. I, again, this idea of I got to fit something in order to feel something I'm supposed to feel doesn't work. It's like I, I can't add another fitness program into this busy life and hope that's the solution. It's I needed something in the moments and my clients need something in the moments to be able to, okay, this is the moment that I'm going to actually reset recover and thrive. And so the breath practice itself called heart flow, it takes 33 seconds to do. I discovered it through rock climbing. Now it's about resetting the fight or flight stress response. And it requires a real discipline in committing to this breath practice, because as soon as you begin to do this, even though it takes less than a minute to do, your brain is not going to like it. <laughs> It battles back right away and it starts to say all sorts of things. The two dominant things it says is one is it doesn't work. There's no way this is going to work. It's not enough. I need to do more. 
And the other one is it's going to tell you that you don't have enough time for this. And so as anybody who hears this and you download that Unleash Your Energy Roadmap and you start practicing this because the steps are there, just know that you're going to come up against a, a, a pattern of your own mind that is so beautiful because you're now going to have a tool that you can work with to start to quiet your mind down so that you can integrate the emotions immediately to then expand into what else is possible. And so what we're doing here in this breath practice is we're doing a four second in, seven second out rotation. Four in, seven out, four in, seven out. So it's three times. You're going in through your nose and out through your mouth or your nose for the seven. Now, the other steps of that is I have my hand on my heart. If you have it available to close your eyes, you close your eyes. And you're just creating in the moment a sense of peace, a sense of calm, and you're bringing yourself back to presence. That's also where you're activating your parasympathetic nervous system. The calmer state, your executive functions now turned on, and you're now this idea on the business front, and I used to do a lot of corporate wellness training. This is your competitive advantage. You're walking into a negotiation and you're feeling stressful or you're standing in front of an audience or whatever the scenario is that you're feeling stressed at work. You drop in the hard flow and you spend that less than a minute to recenter your energy. You have a competitive advantage over everybody else around you. And it's not hard, but it is challenging. I love that you spoke there to the resistance component of the brain not wanting to do it, not wanting or wanting to come up with reasons why or other things to do. Because I think any, and like you said, there's a lot of different strategies you can use to balance your nervous system, especially as you learn about different nervous system states, right? So there's come down from sympathetic. There's also come up from a freeze state or, or dorsal vagal state, depending upon what state you're in. But I, But no matter what it is, there's this constant resistance from the brain to say, no, we should do this. No, let's do this. No, let's get our dopamine hit here. No, let's have, let's get some sugar. Let's do this instead. And so even people that have been working at nervous system regulation, it, it takes time to really rewire those neural pathways. Has that been your experience? Yeah, absolutely. It's so beautiful. The beauty of it is the combination of working with the neuroplasticity and the quantum physics. I had no idea what was going to come for me. It took me having to overhaul my whole life to get into what I was discovering. And that came from rock climbing. And as I started to rock climb, as my athletic pursuits, when I was very unhealthy, I, I just found an indoor rock climbing gym. And I was like, oh, maybe this will be something I can add in and will make me feel better. And it did. And as I became very um, committed to that, I recognize, wait a minute, there's something I am doing when I'm climbing that is very significant for the relationship between how I'm feeling and how my brain is operating. And as I learned the science behind it and dove more into the pursuit of climbing and actually wanted to become a rock climbing mountain guide. And as I pursued more and more, I realized, wow, I am training hours a day for multiple days in a row, for years in a row, I'm training my nervous system out of fight or flight in real fight or flight moments. Mm -hmm. And I recognize, okay, there's something about my fight or flight experience around sugar or my fight or flight experience around being disruptive with my kids or my fight or flight experience with my own unhappiness with how my health is going or my relationship with my partner. Those have a fight or flight experience to them, but we know they're not real. There's not a real danger that's happening. Here I am climbing and I have to reset. I have to, otherwise I am going to die. There's a good chance I will. And so as I'm putting myself in this higher state of fight or flight, the ability to regulate in the same moment was the catalyst for a deepening of what was possible and what I feel is possible for all of us as human beings is the ability to adapt in the moments and having something that works in the moment that we need it shift our experience around the relationship of our own biology, it's amazing what results come immediately. It doesn't take months or years as most of the things that we tend to turn to feel better about what's happening, take time to get a result. And it take time to, to get what you think you need to get from whatever that result's going to bring you. But as soon as you start to regulate and you're consistent with it, 
you start to feel the difference immediately in terms of the peace and calm and more than anything, the sense of presence. Now, all of a sudden you're no longer stuck in your past thought process and you're not stuck in your need for your future to be different. The depressive thinking, the anxiety thinking, you now have space to explore this new area. For most of us, it's a new area to explore, which is presence. And that's where fulfillment is found. It's where purpose is found and it's where growth lives. And it's not difficult if we have the right tool, it just takes some serious discipline and a community around you because you need community when you do this kind of work. I love that you hit on growth there because one of the things I like to say is growth really only happens in the present moment. And so we can right. grow from our past experiences and we can grow towards our goals, but the growth happens right now. It's what I'm doing in this moment. And so I love the highlight there. And I, what I, what I, I'm curious about as you're talking about this and I and I, what comes to mind also is like you said it has an immediate effect. One of the things I did, I don't know, maybe 6 or 9 months ago was there's a there's an app called called NeuroFit and it it gives you little exercises every day. You track your heart rate variability, you track your nervous system state and it gives you an exercise to bring yourself into balance. And their results are through the roof. Their results in terms of the experiences that people have because like you said, it's not a massive amount of investment to get the benefit of shifting your nervous system, to get yeah. the benefit of doing those practices. I'm curious what with the people that you work with over time as to the transformation that they go through, as they go from that state of nervous system dysregulation and burnout or, or whatever state they're in. Yeah. to some future state, what, what are, what does that transformation look like? Yeah. And it's so beautiful. The main, there's few really significant manifestations that come from it, but the main experience starts to evolve around honoring rest. That's something because the brain does not like that. <laughs> Right. So all of a sudden you just, when I work with my clients, they know very specifically, especially the first month we work together, it's just heart flow. You're doing it three times or more a day. It's less than two minutes a day of committed, focused, disciplined, grounded breath practice in the moments you're being triggered. Doesn't take much. Super challenging, but doesn't take much. But you start to crave doing it more and more. And at the same time, what you're doing with that, and it's based off of heart rate variability. So you're training the vagus nerve. So all of a sudden now you're getting this more coherent experience of life. And what you start to realize is that what your brain has been denying you all along is the ability to be at peace, to be restful, which is your natural state. You start to realize that, wow, I'm actually recovering faster every day. I'm feeling more restful. It's not like I need to go find a time to nap or to do my meditation or to do something that's going to get you better. It's actually happening biologically on its own. And you start to feel the power of being at rest in presence, which starts to then recover the other parts of you that want to thrive, predominantly the way your mind functions. So now your executive function is actually working more effectively and efficiently. So you're thinking cleaner and clearer. You have more focus. <laughs> Motivation starts to increase. You start to have the ability to have a flag in the ground for something and something to stand for a mission. Now, all of a sudden, your motivation comes to the point where you're waking up in the morning with a little more energy and that starts to feed on itself. The other thing that starts to change is cravings. So as the cravings start to come and you work with this heart flow in the moment your cravings are coming, you're able to shift your craving for the sugar that you don't want to have. You don't have to eliminate it. You're just creating a moment of pause in the moment that your brain wants you to grab it. You have the ability now to work with that emotion. And let your brain know, wait a minute, I'm good. I actually, I'm actually great. And so there's this beautiful recovery, rest, recovery, and then thriving that all starts to happen at the same time. The other thing that shows up a lot for my, my clients is being in nature. There's this intuitive experience that all of a sudden they start to gravitate to doing more things outside and more things that involve community and family and nature. And that's really neat to, to see how that starts to play a big role in how they spend more of their time. I love the picture you painted there of the changes that you see and the transformation that comes from people moving through these practices and the, these processes. I think, though, that a lot of people may be skeptical 
as they hear it or as they listen to it? Like, how can such a small bit of breathing really Uh make a difference, especially for those that are, I reflect on my past of the leaders, nose to the grindstone, got to get more done, got to hit those quotas. There's uh, not enough hours in the day and you're always frenzied. What do you say to those individuals to convince them or to to help them appreciate why something so simple can actually be so powerful for their life? Yeah. And listen, it always comes down to symptoms because the way that we are reacting to life comes at a cost. And if you're happy with the cost, like if you really pull yourself back for a moment and take an assessment of, okay, how is my sleep? Am I really feeling nourished every night? Do I wake up really feeling restful and really excited about what I get to do? Okay, you have to be honest. How is my nutrition? How is my, how do I feel about myself when I look in the mirror? What are, what's my energy levels like? What's my relationships with my family, with my partner, with my kids? How nourished do they feel really? And you're going to notice pretty quick that if you're a grinder and if you're just grinding, you have some symptoms for sure. And most of that's coming from avoidance. It tends to be a lot of grinding to avoid having to deal with the things that are showing up. Now, when you flip the switch on that and you actually regulate in that process, and I think what a lot of, and I, I've done a lot of executive coaching in my past, there is a capacity increase that comes from doing this, but you won't know it and you won't experience it unless you commit to it. And when you commit to regulating yourself multiple times a day, you start to recognize that you actually have more capacity. You can get more done and you can serve more people without being depleted in your ability to serve. You actually start to work from your overflow. Your ability to rest and recover multiple times a day gives you more to work with, but it takes time to, to create the structure for a very driven executive to pull back for a moment, to let this be something they can bring in, even though it's not difficult, it does take some mental capacity to be okay with letting go of the way that you've been doing it for as long as you've been doing it, to give this a try, to see how it helps to support the symptoms of what around you is not quite working so well that you are now willing to possibly say, okay, it's not working. But you have to be willing, one, like I say, the six steps. One is you have to be willing to pay attention to what's not working. And two, then you have to commit to, to doing the heart flow in those moments. I th- what I think is so interesting is that, especially when it comes to this nervous system regulation and the effort and the, and the shift or the change in practices that you have to do to get to that greater capacity. And I agree with you, you absolutely do get more capacity when you're paying better attention to the messages and the energy levels and the present moment and what's going on in your bodies. But most of the time, we've done the work to ignore all of that. We've done the the work to tune all that out. And so we don't even realize all the wisdom that we're missing out on, all of the information and the access to information that we actually have access to. But I think oftentimes there's not a connection between the challenge that we're having in our life or the issue that we're having in our life and this type of practice. And because it is a practice, because it only happens in the present moment, it's something you have to keep doing. It's not it's not hard and it's not long, but it's something that has to be done regularly. It's not like I do a six week nervous system reset and now my nervous system's good to go for the next three years. It's easy to fall right out of it. Are there longer term practices or strategies that you have people incorporate to help them sustain the changes that they make? Yeah, absolutely. And it's part of the process as you start to, when you commit to regulating yourself throughout the day, you start to shift your ability to choose differently. And so two things are happening. One is you're choosing differently. So you're choosing more and more actions that serve you. Acts of love versus possible alternative, which could be an act of punishment. Now you're starting to choose more actions that are serving you. You're also changing your cravings. And so things start to show up in a way where you actually crave the new feeling. The new feeling's coming because you're actually, like going to the gym and building muscle, you're building the internal muscle of your own nervous system regulation. You're able to use your heart 
And this is where which some of the men out there who hear this and they go, oh, that's a little foofy. I have to bring my heart into the equation. I don't want to bring my heart in it. Yeah, you do though. It's, it's an actual organ, guys. It's okay to embrace your heart because it's powerful, way more powerful than the brain. And as we begin to build coherence through the vagus nerve, and the heart starts to wake up and lets us feel the full capacity of what it can do for us. There's an energy that comes with that. And it starts to take over and you start to notice more and more throughout your day when you're triggered, you don't like how it feels anymore. And you go, oh, wait a minute. I don't like that. I know, know how to reset that. You reset it. What you also begin to do is you also begin to, and I know how this might land, but we'll throw it out there. You begin to manifest the things that you actually do need to continue to feel the way you want to feel. So step three in this process is you have to know what you do want. So as you begin to work with the reset, you're doing heart flow. Now you want to bring in the feeling and the emotions that you do want to experience in your life. And you're going to notice really quick that all the areas of your, the important areas of your own wellness, health and wellness, your sleep, your nutrition, your movement, your relationships around you, they are all going to start to have a, a flow state to them. Things are going to start to enter into your life where your sleep gets taken care of without you having to focus so hard on fixing it. Or your nutrition is going to show up in a way that just seamlessly fits your fitness. Things show up in a way where you're like, wow, I didn't see myself beginning to do racquetball, but that just showed up and it just came in really easy. That's how this works. And so it, by the time that I'm finished working with my clients, and we never really finish, but be able to have a concrete daily ritual around their self-care and self-love in this way, it happens in a way where there is ease and flow to it. And by the time you're done, you have a morning ritual, afternoon ritual, evening ritual that continues to honor your nervous system in ways where you have balance in all those areas. So, so we talked about like that transformation and, and how people incorporate those practices. How often do you see people revert back or struggle to maintain or sustain the changes that they've made? I know you talk about your life and the transformation you've gone through. Have you struggled or do you see that in your clients where they revert back or they have to, to go through the process again? Or what does that look like? Yeah. And this is not about perfection. There's no perfection. We know that. But it's about consistency, being disciplined in the practices. And the practices aren't hard. Heart flow is the first one of the many practices that you dive into. But the key is the discipline. And then the other part is, and when, where people fall off is when they don't have community. You are not meant to do this alone. We know that the, one of the highest needs of human needs is connection, connectivity. And so that's why my program that I run is a group-based program. And I highly recommend anybody who does this kind of work that they, sure, you have one-on-one. -on -one, and ideally, the one-on-one -on -one is with somebody who knows how to co-regulate. That's a big piece that's missing from a lot of the counseling therapy. And I'm not knocking it, but we want to work with people who understand co-regulation. And you want to be in a community of others who understand co-regulation, who know how to regulate themselves and know how to hold space for the community experience of it to be one that's co-regulated. So that most of our experiences with our family and our workplaces, it's very much just trigger activity. It's hard to maintain these practices when the energy all around you all the time is all friction-based energy. You need to be surrounded with a community that knows how to embrace you and help lift you up and you can do the same for them. I think that's really powerful advice and feedback to our listeners and to those that might be interested in this kind of journey because I think that you're right, that connection, that, and to your point, most of this world is dysregulated. So most of our interactions, and that's what pulls us out of our balance or the state that we're in or our optimum state is yeah. the other people that we surround ourselves with. And that then impacts our own level of our capacity to remain in a regulated state, especially as you're encountering that over and over again. And certainly anyone related a lot of the time. And so they come home dysregulated from a day of school. And so it takes effort to stay in that regulated state and to create that space. So if you've got children, that's going to always be part of the mix. So one of my kind of last questions for you, Adam, is around what you've seen. You've been doing this for a long time. You've got a lot of experience. You've probably worked with a lot of people. 
What have you seen in terms of, and this is it's probably unfair question because I'm sure you haven't done this research, but do you feel like more people are aware of this or do you feel like there's still a large population of people that just haven't had even any exposure to the importance of these practices or these concepts? Yeah, it seems like it's at the same time, there's the polar opposites of more and more folks are wanting to have a way to be more at peace and more calm. And then the other side is there's more and more fear-based and anxious-based life experiences. So as the anxiety keeps being put the light on and society keeps looking at the shiny anxiety light and fear light, there's more and more folks that want to get away from that. Mm. And the way out is the way in. It's, you got to go in to find the way out. And if you're not willing to look inward, it's a tricky road because then you're just living in a distracted space. But the more you're willing to go in, then you don't have to be so focused on what we're being fed. And we you know it's a lot of fear and anxiety. So it's happening all at the same time. <laughs> yeah. And, and certainly we are surrounded by it in an ever increasing frequency, right? With media, uh, with technology, with the rate at which information spreads. You know, in the past, we might have been anecdotally aware of things. Today, that information is just right there all the time coming yeah. at us as to what's going on in the world and what's happening and our experiences and our environments. Yeah. And so it you're absolutely right in that it's probably the most people are probably the most triggered in terms of their fight or flight more frequently than in all of all of history because of the world we live in today. It's, it's, it's adaptation and we lack the ability to adapt the amount that we're under. And for anybody who out there who considers themselves a leader, it's our responsibility as leaders to know how to regulate. We know, we have to know how to hold space to co-regulate those in our workforce, support them. Sure. Short story. I did a lot of corporate wellness for about 10 years in 2000. And 10, I was doing a lot of work with the organizations that I, in my major city, which is Vancouver, Canada. And a few of them came to me and they said, Adam, can you maybe support us? Because I was doing a lot of work with the Canadian Mental Health Association. I have a psychological health and safety certification. And so they came and they asked, we're seeing a massive rise in our EFAP benefits for pharmaceutical medication. Do you have any idea why all of a sudden we're getting a, a, a spike in usage? And it, it was mainly for depression and anxiety medication. And not so much that it was the workers, it was also in the family was, was also involved. And I knew right away, I said to them in 2007, there was a massive invention that took a year or two till it reached mass scale. And now here we are three years later and all, we're, all of a sudden, I think we know what we're talking about, right? Yep. The smartphone. And so we're up against it and we have these environments in our workplaces and in our home fronts that are very much completely overtaken by stimulants and stimulation. And the brain, the way the brain operates, doesn't want us to know how to shift out of it because the brain loves it because it's being fed the energy it wants. The two dominant sources are adrenaline and dopamine. And so as leaders in our household, as leaders in our organizations, we have to know how to regulate ourselves from that. Not that we have to eliminate all of these things and live in a cave because that's not reality, but we have to know that if we can regulate ourselves from the stress response of how things are showing up, we can co-regulate others to support them and their experience of it. And so for our coworkers, it's important that we hold in our leadership. It's important that we hold space for them to understand how this works. And for our children, us parents need to know how to co-regulate our kids experience with the gadgets because they are designed for the kids to be captured. And we know us busy parents, when we're tired, it's very easy to say, okay, just go have it, take it, see you later. And that, it's a scary scenario for our kids and they need us to be stronger. They need us to have more energy and they need us to be co-regulating so that they can feel their own emotions and learn to integrate their own emotions so that the next generation is a healthier, more present generation. 
Yeah. And I, I love that you talk about that. That's one of my core motivators in, in everything that I do. And when we look at our ability to evolve as human beings, our ability to grow and, and change and adapt and the neuroplasticity and our ability to rewire our neural pathways, we actually have the ability to create substantial change in terms of how we perform, how we show up, our capacity for performance, our ability to handle and deal with challenges and issues in our lives. But it requires that regulation. At a foundational point, you have to be in a balanced nervous system state in order to rewire your neural pathways. And so if we're dysregulated, if your children are dysregulated or if you're dysregulated, you're not going to learn. You're not going to grow. You're not going to change. And I always talk about we've created this world with all this stress and all these challenges and, and did, to get the attention of our, of our children. Um, and and I'll, I'll share a funny story as you talk about kids and gadgets. Um, my son was on an, an iPad. He's seven years old. And there he was. There was one day my my parents had him. And all of a sudden, when we got the iPad back, like 30 minutes later, there were like 100 new games downloaded. <laughs> He'd gone down some. Yeah, this one looks cool. And let me click on this one. And we were like, how in the world did you add all these games, all these apps this quickly? But it's set up in that way, right? It's set up to take yeah. advantage of the way that we think and the dopamine hit that our kids get when they click that and they get to play that new game and they get to have that experience. And so I think what's really powerful and really important for all of us to remember, like you said, it's important for leaders, but I, I like to think of us all as leaders in our own homes. Yeah. And if we're going to lead, guide and direct and help our children to grow and evolve into this world that we have created, then we have to figure out how to do it first. And so we yeah. have to figure out how to regulate our nervous system, how our bodies work, how to grow and how to develop so that we can support our families. That's it. That's it. And we are the, the lead by example is legit. And so we have to do that. But you don't have to. But if you don't, there's going to be symptoms that come from that. And as parents, one of the main symptoms is a disconnect in the way you communicate with one another. The resentment that you get towards your partner because you start fighting more because the kids are disruptive and then it all starts to crumble apart and we know how that goes and that's where the majority of relationships are. And that comes from a disconnect with our own response to life. So I guess the big message here is that it's not hard to regulate the nervous system and train the nervous system into present state. You need a tool that works in the moments of your busy life. So I invite you to explore heart flow 33 seconds and practice and find yourself that community around you that really understands the power of doing this as the primary focus and everything else falls into place after you do that. All the fitness and the diets and the this and the, it all comes, but this is the foundation. Having a healthy, robust nervous system is the foundation for living a very beautiful, very enjoyable, fulfilled life. I, I love that. And I think that you have provided her audience with just so many great strategies and understanding of this super complex, super challenging, I, I guess not super complex or challenging, but certainly impactful issue that we're all facing with some pretty simple strategies. So Adam, as we we wrap up this episode, do you have any final thoughts or, or insights or observations you want to share with our audience? I would just get to my website and grab that download, the Unleash Your Energy Roadmap, six steps. It's at clearimpact.io, clearimpact.io, and let presence be your guide. I absolutely love it. We will put that in the show notes. So if you are looking at this on YouTube or if you're looking at this on your podcast platform, it'll be in the show notes for you to be able to click there, go check it out. I downloaded it. I can't wait to dive into and check out the roadmap and, and all of the, the valuable information that's in it. Adam, thank you so much for coming on today. It's been a great episode. I love this topic so much. I hope that this inspires members of our audience and our listeners to take action, get in touch with Adam, get his roadmap, start on this path to regulating your nervous system. It's going to impact your life in profound and meaningful ways, and it's going to impact the lives of everyone around you, your spouse, your children, your family, whomever you're interacting with. It's going to make such a big difference. 
And it, like Adam said, 33 seconds, right? That's what you said. 33 seconds to do that balancing. So not a major commitment worth doing. So check it out. Thank you so much to our listeners for listening in to this episode. As always, I like to event, uh, to end every episode just reminding you all to just always keep evolving, keep growing, keep looking at for those opportunities to expand and rewire your neuropathways so that you can live an exceptional life, so that you can have those exceptional experiences on your life journey and you can look back at the end of your life and be happy with the life that you've lived. Have a wonderful day and we'll be back again next week with another episode.